And thank you very much for your time this lunchtime because uh, uh, I'm a student and I started off in Winchester School of Art and I now live in Winchester in an apartment looking at the School of Art. How weird is that? So, I love thin, fine lines and I'm not ashamed to admit it. You can tell by the shirt, right? I, I just love thin, fine lines. And uh, it started early, um, but uh, nowadays, uh, I think you'll agree this is a little sad, probably. Um, every single shirt I own has got thin, fine stripes on it, thanks to my wonderful wife. But on the other hand, it's only the direction that's changed, because I'm still passionate about thin, fine lines, and I have been all my life. I see them everywhere. I see them in the window of the back of this theatre. Um, I see them you know, along the top of here, and I just sort of, it's my thing, it's my passion, right? And I hope you find a passion in your life as well. So stupidly, I went to art college, uh, and at some point in time during your life, somebody will say to you, what do you want to do with your life? And, and I'm sure someone's already been asked that here in this room, and it's, it's a difficult question, isn't it, really? But uh, I always wanted to be involved with technology. Now, for those of you who are old enough or have seen the reruns of Tomorrow's World on the BBC from the 1970s and 80s, uh, there were two people, Raymond Baxter and uh, James Burke. And Raymond Baxter was a sort of gentlemanly old man with a very calm voice, and he was the sort of voice of reason. And then there was James Burke, who was an enthusiastic technology puppy, and he would just go and do anything. Uh, and the two of them, I thought, was a great combination and I thought, if I could grow up to be one or other of those, or both, I'd really feel I'd achieved something. Uh, but I wanted to teach a computer to draw in the same way as I could think and see. And I was thinking and seeing in thin, fine lines, so that's, why, that's what got me started. Uh, but I also wanted to be happy doing it, because there's nothing worse than being unhappy in your work and job. Uh, when I got to college, they said, you want to do what with our computer? Draw thin, fine lines. Uh-uh. But I didn't take no for an answer. And uh, I went and found a couple of people who were similarly like-minded. And I found a guy in IBM in um, America, and I wrote to him. And about three months later, I got a reply. And it's, he said, uh, it looks like you're sitting in front of a tectonics terminal for a deck computer. He said, I work at IBM, so I'm not going to help you. Hmm, he was only in it for the money. Uh, so search out like-minded friends and trust them, even if it gets you into trouble. Now, how can, how can art get you into trouble? Well, as, as you do at art college, uh, I met up with a girl, she was in the knitwear department, and she was cute, and um, she got, came in to see me on uh, one Monday at coffee time and said, I've been given this project to knit a scarf in three weeks. Uh, okay, and she showed me these uh, punched cards that they had to hand punch for like knit and color and whatever it was. And the knitting machine would then punch, take the deck of cards and knit the scarf, but they had to hand punch it and it would take them three weeks to punch the cards. And I thought, I've seen those cards. So I went into the knitwear uh, department and snuck the manual for their knitting machine and read the bit about how it. Uh, uh, works with the cards, and then wrote a piece of software to punch my own deck. So that was a Monday. Uh, by Wednesday afternoon, we had some software running, and uh, Anne came in and, and um, drew on the screen with a little thumbnail. We were only allowed to use black and white, so it was one run was red, next run was green, next one was blue, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> so Thursday morning, she takes the deck down, punches the deck of cards, Voila, three foot scarf. Takes it into the knitwear um, tutors and they immediately said, you, Gordon, are fired out of the college because you're interfering with another student. So that was the end of my career at college, or so I thought, but it wasn't. And I'll tell you about why later. Uh, so do share your dreams with people and don't lose sight of your goals. Now, um, when I was at art college, I thought the difference between me using a computer to draw 
and somebody using painting to draw versus a guy in a Stone Age cavern is really only the level of technology you're using, right? And if it's okay to go from there to there, it's certainly okay to do what I'm doing and go from, you know, uh, <laughs> how do I upload the image in this piece here? Which I thought was very funny and Wiley has been an inspiring uh, um, uh, artist for me over the years. So, what did I learn at college? Well, there's one of my early black and white drawings and don't forget the college would only let me use black and white pen black pen or white paper at two to four in the morning because their computer was being used by other students. So it wasn't really optimal. Um, and that image there is the Freedom Tower in Tehran in 1971, built in 1971, and that was the inspiration for that drawing. So you get the connection there. Now, what I didn't know was that um, some, well, we had an exhibition, okay, in the middle of the second year, and uh, somebody asked to buy my drawing through, this, through the, the university. And what I didn't know was that that person happened to be placed very highly. Now, she was also the dean's wife, and she was from Persia. So she recognized the tower in the drawing, bought the drawing, and I got 10 quid, which I thought was great, because that's 40 pints of beer for a student at that time. Uh, <laughs> and when I got kicked out of the college for interfering with my knitwear student friend, uh, I appealed to the dean, and the dean said, oh, yes, I know what you're doing. My wife's got one of your drawings. And I'm like, wow. That was my first sale, and I didn't even know it was her because she bought it anonymously through the college. But thank you very much to um, Terry Brackenbury and his wife because they kept me basically alive. So that, guess what I learned? Make friends in high places. Now, the other thing I learned is never let a performance artist evaluate your work. Uh, and at the end of three years in art college, you have a, an external assessor. And because the art department didn't really like me very much, they gave me an external assessor called Bruce Beasley, who was a performance artist. Now, performance art got lots of notoriety for doing weird things. And Bruce's speciality was being sick on stage at will in front of an audience. He was my external assessor. And he came in, he took one look at my three years' worth of work and said, that's not art. And that was the sum total, four words, for my three years from my external assessor. Oh, if I ever find him in a dark alleyway, he's in trouble. But as it turned out, um, I got the last laugh because uh, I went out of college, took my drawings to a computer dealership in a sort of rage, really. And the guy said, I'll buy nine of them uh, if you frame them. And would you like a job? And I never looked back. That was the luckiest thing I got. So there is a, a certain amount of luck involved in your future. And I hope, you, I hope my luck rubs off on you as well. So in 1981, the technology was nowhere near the color and resolution that I wanted, as you can tell from those black and white drawings versus what we can do today. It was painfully slow. It was inaccessible. Uh, like I said, I had to work between 2 and 4 in the morning uh, in, on the computer because that was the only time they would give me. There were very few software libraries and, and development tools and so on. Uh, and you know, buying your own personal computer in 1981 was way out of anybody's pocket. Uh, I learned to get patience because it was clear that you know, it would develop. But the question is, how long would it take? Uh, so I watched a lot of the technologies over the... The, the time uh, and watch them improve. And I had to wait pretty much 30 years before the next um, big leap in, in stuff came out. And it was the iPad, um, 3rd of April 2010. And in o October that year, um, I had my first app released. So it's not that long, you know. Uh, and I hooked up with a guy who was a software programmer because I wasn't very good at math with, as, as it was, Objective-C at the time. And um, we got an app running in eight days, and it had color, and it had touch, and it had resolution, and it had a lot of the things that you'll see on here. All these um, app pictures and images down here are built with my app, if you're interested at all. Uh, but my app now drew the way I wanted to, and it's available in the App Store, and it's been down it gets downloaded every day somewhere in the world. Uh, just recently, I got 2,000 downloads 
2,560 downloads from China, all in the same day. That's a bit spooky. So I've got a horrible feeling they're going to be making a clone of my app and selling it sometime soon. Anyway, it, to me, it's not bunch of, just a bunch of lines. Uh, I think it's a, a tool for me to express how I see the world, how I feel about the world. And some of the images that you'll see come from science and technology. Some of them come from flamenco dancing. Some of them come from um, just things I see in the world. Uh, but it makes me happy. Uh, like, what, an M what would an MRI feel like if, you were, if I was having one? And I, that's, those are the images I came up with. You may like them. You may laugh. I wish you would. Um, but I also, what did I learn in the 30 years in between college and now? Uh, that software moves on. I worked with Claris Works for a long time to draw. And, uh, phew, that was painful. Uh, but one of the things that it did teach me was that software can gracefully decline. So images like this over here um, were taken by, you know, moving mid objects on the screen and keep it going and going and going until it died and bombed and crashed. And just before it did that, I would take a photograph. So knowing when it was about to crash was key. And then I'd snap an image of it. Um, but this, you know, all the technologies were advancing at the same time. Inkjet printers were coming along. Laser, color laser printers were improving. Uh, screen resolution was the big thing for me. Um, print resolution, suddenly we got P, uh, vector images and that greatly improved everything. Uh, so there was a lot of waiting going on for 30 years. In the meantime, I had a career. Um, oh, here's one of the other things, um, I made, <laughs> you can do this in the States, you can't really do it here, um, but I made my own stamps and I sent one to my dad and he was just over the moon. Um, that I managed to take my own artwork and turn it into stamps. Now, you can only do it in the States, and you can still do it today, as long as you don't use an image of somebody's face. Uh, stuff I'm proud of. Um, while I was having this sort of accidental career in high technology, I did a lot of weird things, and I don't know why. Um, I just volunteered for sort of the oddest things that happened. Um, but I did do some interesting stuff. I put the first legal emails into some of the countries like Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, uh, and so on. <laughs> that was a pain in the ass. It really was. I worked at eight, uh, did eight years at CBIT, which is the Hanover Fair for computing. And that is, if you ever go to an industrial fair in Germany, they are outstandingly interesting. Just do go. If you get a chance, go. Uh, Apple launched in 1991 into Eastern Europe. And so I got a, a, a job from Apple, a project, to do um, apps, a graphic app, a spreadsheet, a word processor, and a database in Hungarian, Czech, Russian, and Polish. And Apple worked uh, in a very odd way. They would start a project, give you a check, and say, come back when you're done. So you had to get a team of people together and organize and do everything, just like a startup. And then when the project was done, you move on to another startup. So Apple was a very sort of startup-centric kind of way of working, but I don't think they really knew it at the time. Um, and one of the things I did there was the first Mac to PC video tool, uh, which was heresy, because Macs weren't supposed to talk to PCs at all. Uh, and unfortunately, that was the end of my career at Apple, because myself and all 30 of the staff that I was uh, were working on it all got laid off on the same day, along with 4,100 other people. So um, remember, you can <laughs> you never see that tide coming, do you? And then suddenly, bang, and uh, you're out of a job. But I did get to be the custom USB guy at SanDisk, as, as um, Ruben said. So I got my, did get my own custom USB drive out of it. Uh, for those of you who know Sasha Fierce at all, anybody know what Sasha Fierce is? is it, yes? Yeah, go on. Beyonce. Beyonce, yeah. It's, Sasha Fierce was Beyonce's alter ego, and she asked me to do this $30,000 diamond-studded USB drive. The, the memory cost like eight bucks. <laughs> so people have got more sense than money. Some of them do, anyway. Uh, in the Eastern European project, I learned that it's uh, really cold in Moscow in the winter. Really, really cold. 
uh, like minus 27 degrees. Uh, anybody been there? No? Yes. Really cold, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Apple IBM project. Um, I, if I would say any, give you any advice, if somebody comes up with the most difficult project you can think of, do it because it'll challenge you. Now, uh, Apple and IBM had a problem, or a, you know, it was actually Aramco, the American oil company in the Middle East. They were drilling in the wrong place for oil because the resolution of the screens on their IBM terminals wasn't good enough. Uh, so they asked Apple if we would add um, a, a Macintosh, nice, beautiful graphic front end to their big database and do it in Arabic. So we've got an Apple talking to an IBM mainframe, and if that wasn't hard enough at the time, and politically incorrect at the time, they wanted us to do it back to front and in Arabic. So that project was probably one of the toughest things I ever did, but it, you know, it, I had, had to find someone who was not Jewish. Uh, and if you ever tried to find a programmer who works in the Middle East who's not Jewish, there are not very many of them. So I found a guy in Canada and tracking him down without the aid of the internet. Tell you something, that's hard. Um, I also got a chance to teach children in Africa uh, or get computers to children in Africa to help them speak English and teach and, and count uh, and, and learn stuff about the world. And that was possibly the most rewarding thing I ever did because we got loads of email from the parents saying, thank you very much for teaching our children um, English and numeracy, and that just breaks your heart, and it makes me uh, cry even now. Um, but I did learn that religion is cruel just about everywhere in the world, uh, and I hope you get to fix that, somebody. Now, if Michael Jackson had lived, you'd all have one of these if you went to his concerts. Now, this is what I'd call real bad luck. Um, you all know Michael Jackson, I presume. <laughs> You're all of the right age. And uh, they picked, actually, um, a purple USB drive with yellow lettering, as it turned out. And these were the mock-ups that we did to get this project. Um, and that, this was what I did on my own uh, after I left SanDisk. It was my own little chip shapes project. And what did I learn? Seriously, don't have just one customer even if you think he's going to live. Right? So don't put all your eggs in one basket if you're going to have a startup. It, it, it was absolutely gutting. Um, I was watching CNN. Uh, well, I wasn't watching CNN. I was sitting at home just days after we'd made this agreement with these guys. Uh, and they were about to cut us a check for like $27 million to get this project going because we, we actually got the contract, right? And in the week between the time they said hi and the time we got the check, he died. And somebody called me and said, Gordon, turn on CNN. And I thought, oh, no, no, it's another 9-11 thing. And it wasn't. It was a Michael Jackson thing. And I was hoping it was a PR stunt, but it wasn't. So unfortunately, I had to sort of shutter up my startup and uh, decide to do something else. But I moved back here, and that was that. So do have a backup plan. Uh, in case it go, all goes horribly wrong. Now, um, we're still good for time. On dreaming big, uh, how many of you ever know what Thunderbirds was? Thunderbird 1, I think there's one, two, there's a couple of hands here. You may have seen not the first one, but the second, the second rerun or the third rerun. Now, these were the original models. Uh, this is, uh, I, I saw this when I was like 12, and I thought, wow, those are fantastic. 40 odd years on, and we've actually got products like that. Isn't that amazing? I, I think it's actually incredible that somebody dreamt up a, lift, a, a vertical takeoff and flying swing wing variable geometry thing as a puppet um, program, but we've actually built it. The same thing's true for their Thunderbirds 2. We've got the Super Guppy. Uh, and for uh, Thunderbird 3, single stage to orbit rockets with the idea. We've actually got single stage to orbit rockets thanks to Elon Musk. 
Now, if you, did any of you see the launch uh, last week? My goodness, what an absolutely fantastic thing. Not only did he launch it into space, but he returned the two boosters back to Cape, Cana uh, Cape Kennedy, sorry, I'm showing my age there, uh, and landed them within a couple of seconds of each other upright. That's just showing off. That really is, but my goodness, I am so pleased to see technology at work like that. It's just awesome. It gives you the chills. Um, same is true with Thunderbird 4. We've, we can now search the oceans deeper than we ever could before. And as for Thunderbird 5, uh, we had one go with Skylab. And if you've ever read the book House in Space, uh, which is all about Skylab, have a read. It's really interesting. Um, Mir, obviously the Russians crashed theirs into the ocean, and the ISS, which Trump has just defunded. Thanks very much, you idiot. Um, so what do we learn here? Some older ideas are great, but they lack the technology to be really valid. So it's actually quite a good idea to, if you've got an idea of something, go and research the history of it and see if anybody else tried to do something like that and then take that idea and use today's technology to improve it. Uh, just about anything is really possible these days. Uh, we've, the development of technology has been so big, the pace of the rate of change is changing, so stuff is getting faster and faster and faster. And it's difficult to keep up, I'll admit. Yeah, so talking about house in space, um, if you've, it's, I always think it's interesting to talk to people who've done a really big, huge project like Steve Squires and the Mars Rovers. If you see this guy talk, giving a talk, go to it. If you see Adam Stoltzner, uh, whose book The Right Kind of Crazy is a good read, go and, go and talk to him or listen to him as well. Um, these are people who've had all amazing challenges and figured out how to do it somehow. And reading these books is absolutely inspirational. So 40 years on, uh, I'm still involved with technology. I am mentor startups, as Ruben said, here and elsewhere. Um, I created a map, an app to draw the way I like. Uh, and actually, I'm, I, I'm actually pretty happy. You know? So many thanks for your time. Uh, there's a website there if you want to grab my app. And uh, I think we'll part, open it up to any questions for anybody. Um, I think the one thing I'd like to see happen in 30, 40 years' time is a real big change in social media because at the moment it's killing people, uh, literally killing people. And I think that is the biggest challenge for the, you know, like your generation, if you like, is to figure out how to fix that because there's way too much online bullying, there's way too much trolling. It's got to stop. It has got to stop. And I don't know if that means shutting down Facebook or whatever, but it is literally killing children. Uh, and I think that's the scariest thing that I see in your future and mine. Uh, and anything that you can do to, to fix that, um, please go ahead and do it. Become passionate about it. I see a lot of people nodding here, which is a little scary because you obviously recognize the problem. I think it was the same goal. Um, I wanted to draw with the computer, but I wanted to do it on my terms, not what was just available at the time. And uh, watching, you know, going, you know, I'd go to computer exhibitions and check out all the print <coughs> printers to see how good they were. Um, and it was just painfully slow watching the development of all these things happen, uh, especially screen color and the ability to control and manipulate uh, drawings and images like with uh, Illustrator, for example, became gradually, painfully, slowly better. And I couldn't really wait, but I had to. But no, the mission didn't change. No. So the first shop I went into to, sell, to try and sell drawings, the guy says, I'll buy nine. If you want to work for me, fine. That's, that was great. That was the first. <laughs> Glad I said yes. And uh, from there, um, I got headhunted by another networking company that sold their products to that store. And from that company, I got headhunted into Apple. So I never actually had an interview for 
uh, a long time. Uh, but I did need an interview, or they, they requested an interview, in the, in the time when I moved from Paris, where I spent five years with Apple Europe, uh, and the Middle East and Eastern Europe, and the States. Now, the States actually required me to do an interview, uh, which is weird because I had the job anyway. <laughs> But uh, I went to the Apple's HR and interviewed, and the lady had these like ice blue eyes and just stared right through you. And I did nothing but just be on was honest, uh, because I'd never had an interview before. And uh, I said, well, you know, what do you like to do? What, what? Oh, yeah, well, I like to do this and that, the next thing. But I didn't have the language of, um, oh, I drove the team and I made my things. I just did it from like the heart. And <laughs> about halfway through, she says to me, You've never had an interview before, have you? I said, no, I haven't. Yeah. And she said, well, here's, uh, I'm going to give you the, some tickets uh, to get on the next plane to the States because I think it's worth it. Um, and that was that, really. Uh, and I never had another interview after that. I kept getting headhunted from place to place. So I guess I must have been doing something right. If I could teach people like Mark Zuckerberg to do the same thing, I'd be doing it every day. Um, how does that, yeah, because on the way up to success, there's a lot of failure. You just have to remember those. And that, that can be painful, Michael Jackson. <laughs> so yeah, it, it is hard, but it is it really important to maintain a little bit of humility um, because you never know what's coming. You know, It could be something big or it might not be. And it's, that's, it's just something you need to keep in mind when you're doing anything, really. How do I cope with failure? Uh, well, let's take Michael Jackson as the first one. Um, I went out and got absolutely smashed, is what I did. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, I coped with it very badly. I think a bottle and a half of Pinot Noir and some scotch was the, the result of that. But you have to pick yourself up and move on. And I had um, a partner at the time who worked in the music industry, uh, and she was a fantastic woman. She's like Aretha Franklin on steroids. And um, she and I, she managed the music side of it, and I managed the technology side of that, that project. Um, and sadly, uh, three months after he died, she died of a heart attack as well. So that was a, like a double whammy. Um, and I went to her funeral, and I was like the only white guy there, uh, which was a bit scary. But it was fabulous. I mean, um, she, we, we tried, right? And it wasn't our fault that we failed. So we would have carried on. If that had happened, we would be running the USB music business, and music would be a different thing today. It wouldn't be on an iPod or an iPhone. It might be on a USB drive. But that was then. This is now. You know, things change. And maybe our business would have been railroaded by the first iPod. Who knows? Um, remind yourself every day to have a laser-like focus on what you do. I mean, I don't care if you write it up in six-foot-high letters on the wall of your room. Remind yourself every day what the, the main directive is. Um, I, for myself, I just did drawings when I could, and I left them around the house, much to the annoyance of some people. Uh, and that way, I would see them every day and remind myself that I should be doing something. I mean, I had to wait a long time, but once, once it was working, that's fine. Uh, the only thing I've kind of defocused on since building this app for my own private benefit, really, um, is going and doing the same thing on beaches with a rake. So I've, I've sort of branched out now. And I have two things that I do in my life. When I go on vacation, I take a rake and draw huge patterns in the sand along. Thin fine lines again, but just in the sand, and I take a drone to photograph them, and that's kind of my hobby now. So a laser light focus, you, you've got to be obsessive about it. I don't know how you make yourself obsessive about it without doing something strange, but, but um, maybe, yeah, big posters around, whatever. Not one that says, uh, you know, there's motivational posters you get sometimes. <coughs> no, not those. Now, do something completely different. Um, just walk up to them and say hello. <laughs> That's really how you do it. 
there's, there's, there isn't any real secret. If, some, if you see you know, the dean of the college walking through here, go and say hello. I'm, I'm sure it'll be, he won't remember half the students, but on a smaller scale, maybe, um, just go and say hi to people. It's quite, uh, it's, it's literally that easy. Yeah, I think I know what you mean here. Um, selling your soul to the devil, I think is what you're yeah. talking about, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, guilty. I mean, I, I went and worked for other companies to get a salary, um, and the meanwhile I kind of watched what was going on. Uh, that doesn't, for me it was a sort of much longer period of time, but I think uh, if you go and work for a company that's doing something similar to what you want, uh, get as much experience as you can, and then at some point strike out on your own. Um, and they, won't, they, they will probably be flattered if you do something like that. Um, but don't burn your bridges behind you, you know, ever. And you guys have got all the tools now. You've got contact lists and all that. You know, you've got the whole internet Google search thing going on. I mean, you can stay connected with a lot of people. Um, just make sure they're the right ones. No, I did, it. Uh, I did all the design and UI stuff myself because I'd spent lots of time at Apple. In fact, when, when I went to Apple the first time, um, they give you a week's induction course. And the first morning is how to find the loo and get your salary done and your um, user ID and your badge. And then from the rest of that week is user interface design and why Apple so, in so intensely concentrates on it. So you get a first, you get absolutely drowned in UI the first week you go. Uh, and I think that's really important because it teaches, <laughs> if, if you're in the computer industry and you're working with engineers all the time, you'll find that they'll find the path of least resistance to a result. And sometimes that's not a good thing for other people to see. Right? So engineering your way to a, a solution is not necessarily the right thing. Having fig ha trying to figure out how real human beings want to use it is far more important. And the design will, if, if, the form will follow the function if you see a remainder. Um, if, if you know what you want to do, the design of it should sort of become evident after you've done all your testing with, user, with real human beings. If, it, if you've ever been to a silicon fab um, place, it is phenomenal in its automation. There's very few people, there's an enormous amount of automation. Uh, and it's only automation that gets you to that scale. And scale is something that human beings just really don't understand. Um, if, if I was to ask you how many, you, you know, um, let's say memory things, memory chips, whether it's a SD card or a micro USB or a USB card or micro SD card, SanDisk makes an enormous amount of them. The, when I left SanDisk, they were making 42 units a second around the clock. Okay, I don't know if you can imagine that, but it's an awful lot. And they had five massive fabs. The first fab uh, was you know, the, their first one. The second one built twice as much as the first one. The third one built twice as much as the other two put together. The fourth one built twice as much as the previous three put together, and so on. So every time they build a new fab, it makes twice as much as the previous factories. So you've got this exponential rise. Now, we did an interesting experiment one night when, when uh, Mike and I were really bored, and we were the USB guys. He did the, the non-custom ones, and I did the custom ones. And the, the experiment we did was we had all the systems at our disposal, so we checked out how many pieces of raw memory we made um, every day, right? And then sort of multiplied it up, and it turned out to be like seven container loads of raw memory. That's without the packaging. Uh, seven container loads, 40-foot container loads a day. And that was years ago. Nowadays, uh, and I called Mike about three years ago, I think it was, and asked him if he would do that again just because I was giving a talk. And it's now up to like 42 container loads a day. I don't know, if you, if you imagine 42 trucks of memory coming through the park here, it may, you know, it's a lot. 
And we really don't understand scale until you think, oh, look, every Olympic stadium, when there's an event, you see those light flashes go off when they, the opening ceremony. There's people using a ton of memory right there. Uh, lots and lots of it. And you know, they, they'll never fill those cards. They really won't. <laughs> They're huge. But you need it, right? Tech versus art. Uh, sometimes the Americans don't get it. Are there any Americans in the room? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, tech versus art. I think um, in Europe, people are far more forgiving about an art thing, if you like, an art project. Uh, as far as tech's concerned, most Europeans will find um, more, do more examination of a project um, before they go further, because they know that it's got to be in multiple languages, maybe, or it's got to be distributed in lots of countries with diff different distribution styles. Um, so they, the Europeans tend to be more sympathetic to each other's issues, whereas in America, it's kind of like, screw it, we'll just shove it. Yeah. <laughs> and and I've, I found the, their approach to be a bit blunt and unconsidered, um, although they probably wouldn't tell me that. Does that answer the question? Okay. Well, let's thank Jordan for coming along. And thank you for your time.